car tightened up. That was all sharp. Good morning. Let's all stand. Father, we want to thank you this morning because, Lord, you have given to us another opportunity, and, Lord, we don't want that opportunity to pass us by without us 
taking advantage of it, an opportunity to worship you, Father, an opportunity to tell you, Lord, how thankful we are for all that you have done and are doing in our lives, Lord. And so this morning, Lord, we just want to set aside every distraction, anything of last week, anything of next week, Lord, that might, you know, garner our attention. We just want to set that aside this morning, Lord, and just focus on you, the worthy one, to lift our voices and praise and raise our hands and surrender. We ask that the power of your Holy Spirit would be here this morning present, working in us and through us, Lord, we ask. And so, Lord, we just invite you right now, this moment, to be our very special guest in this place. Fill this place with your presence, we ask. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Hey, let's remain standing. I have a man. thank you so much that you, you know everything about us, you know every thought and you still love us and you still like us and want to spend time with us, Lord. But Father, we just thank you that you're always with us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us no matter what we go through. And we can come boldly to your throne in times of need for help which is all the time because we need your help, Lord, just to live this life for you. I lift my eyes up unto the mountain my hell come from my hell comes from
source for everything, Lord. And we are so thankful, so thankful and grateful, Lord, for the work that you're continuing to do in our lives. We are all works in progress, and we will have great days with you, and then we'll have totally crummy days. But Lord, we thank you that you are always there to pick us up, dust us off, Cleanse us and forgive us and renew in us a right spirit to move forward with you. Thank you, Lord. the 
your breath is your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out this morning you know it doesn't matter what kind of week we had Lord we are still saved we're still washed in the blood of the lamb 
Lord, your spirit is still in us because you won't leave us nor forsake us. Lord, we, we thank you for that promise. We thank you for the promise of eternal life. We thank you for the promise that what you begin, you finish, Lord. We thank you for that promise that one day you're going to present us faultless before the Father of glory with exceeding joy. Lord, And our only prayer would be this morning that it could come soon. Man, we are so done with this place, Lord. We want to go home. What is it going to be like when we step on the other side of this thing? I've been thinking a lot about it lately, Father. And so, Lord, I pray that you just encourage the hearts of the people this morning. Lord, there's a lot of needs represented here this morning, a lot of people traveling. Lord, we want to pray for, for Max and George's up in Washington State visiting his sister for her birthday and for uh, Tiffany and Jeff Cook and their family, Lord, Prudence and her family, Erica and their family, Lord, down south and so many others moving around. Father, we just pray for traveling mercies. Pray for Pastor Aaron and enjoy as they celebrate up in the mountains, Lord, in a little retreat place there, their, their anniversary. Bless that, Lord, this weekend. And just all the others, Lord, that may be homesick or whatever, Lord, we just lift them before you. But this morning for us that are here, Father, we just pray that your spirit would be at work. I want to pray for Judy this morning who goes in to have her knee replaced uh, tomorrow. Around one o'clock, Lord, we just pray that the surgery would go well and and everything would be right and heal up soon. Pray for Frank's sister, Lord. It doesn't look like she's going to be here long. You know, the hospice is called in. She's going to go to be with the Lord. Lord, we just lift that before you. And Lord, we especially want to pray this morning for Pastor Rick and for Charlotte. Lord, it looks like Charlotte's in the last stages of the cancer. Lord, hospice is coming in and doesn't look like she's going to be here much longer. She's going home. And Lord, we just pray for Rick. I talked to him at length yesterday on the phone and having a real hard time with it. Lord, we, we lift that before you this morning. And just pray for your peace and for your will to be done there, Lord. And again, we pray for Peggy, who just recently lost her husband. Memorial service, November the 9th here at the church. And just lift that before you as well, Lord. So many needs. But we thank you, Father, that we have you to lean on. And for you to comfort us, because you are the God of all comfort. And uh, so we just lift these things to you this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, and all God's kids that say, amen. amen. Spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot this morning.
If we can find our places, we'll get moving this morning. I got a whole bunch of announcements. All right. Don't make me ring the bell, guys. You want me to ring the bell? Okay, I got to ring the bell. All right. Hey, I have um, four or five announcements, and every one of them are important. Hey, don't forget next week um, we have a time change. And if you forget to set your clock back, you'll just be here an hour early. And so uh, we'll have the coffee waiting for you. And so uh, make sure that you set your clocks back. Uh, don't forget November the 2nd, which is this Friday night, is movie night here at the church at 6 p.m. We're going to be watching the movie The Apostle of Christ. And we're going to be having pizza and popcorn and root beer floats. So uh, that's a good cheap date night for you and your wife. So make sure you come out. Great movie. Don't forget that this coming Saturday from 8 till noon is church work day. We got a few things around the church that just need to be taken care of. Also, don't forget to bump elbows instead of shaking hands. We got the flu and cold thing going around again. A lot of people are homesick. And uh, it's pretty nasty one this year. So make sure that you just kind of, there's hand sanitizer all around the building that you can pick up and use. Uh, please do that. And don't forget to pray for Rick, Pastor Rick and Charlotte. I talked to him yesterday at length, and it doesn't look like Charlotte. Um, she's in extreme pain, the cancer, even the, um, the me pain medication they're giving her is not cutting the edge on the pain, and she's at the very end. And so we just want to pray that the Lord would either heal her completely or take her home to be with him and no more the pain. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's turn our Bibles. We're getting close to, the, to finishing the book of Acts. We've come as far as chapter 26 and verse 21 there. That's where we'll pick up this morning, and I think we should get halfway through chapter 27, and then we'll finish it up next week, uh, the week after that, the book of Acts, and we'll start the book of Romans, the gospel according to Paul. So as you're turning there, there's a lot of things that are applicable to our lives still as we're working our way through the end here, and so let's pray and we'll dive right in. You know, Father, we thank you for your word, and you know, we learn so much, I do anyway, uh, just in in the life of Paul, how he is living out his life. N not just the things that he is saying, but the things that are written, you know, between the scenes, between those powerful and pithy statements of doctrinal truth that he lays out for us. There's a lot just in, in watching his life and, and seeing, Lord, his attitude and his understanding of who he is in you and what he's to be about, the boldness that he has, the passion, um, uh, just the confidence, Lord. And, and Lord, even in those moments when he's not so confident and he's weary and he's tired and you cheer him up, Lord, there's just so much to, to apply to our lives from watching his life being lived out there in the first century as we're living our lives out here in the 21st century. So, Lord, as we look at these things this morning, there's some things that, that are extremely pithy. Yeah, they, they're challenging and I know that I've been challenged, Lord, having read and studied this week and prepared uh, for the message this morning that are just powerful, Lord. So may those things uh, just impact our hearts, we pray, and then give permanency to those things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We left Paul last week in a very interesting place. If you'll go back to chapter 25, we'll read there in verse 23 that he now is standing before Agrippa II. You remember that he stood before Felix and his wife, uh, Drusilla. And then after standing before Felix and Drusilla, uh, there's a little baby just walked in. Somebody let one out of the nursery. <laughs> Hey, I don't blame you, man. If you can escape, escape. <laughs> if you can get out, get out, man. I've been back there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's good to get loose when you can, so. Anyway, we left him there after he stood before Felix and Drusilla. They faded from the scene. Festus comes in as the proconsul of the region. Agrippa II with his, his wife Bernice has come down to greet him. And there... Festus informs Agrippa that there was a man left in bonds, in chains, in prison there in the palace um, that he doesn't know quite what to do with. 
the Jews have brought charges against him, but none of them are worthy of death or not even, even worthy of, of stripes. And so he, you know, he assembles, assembles these guys to kind of find out as we left him there what they can write to Caesar because Paul has appealed to Caesar of some crime that he's committed. And we read there in verse 23, and on the morrow when Agrippa was come with Bernice, that is Drusilla's sister. We gave you all the information and background on that. This is Agrippa the second. Agrippa's uh, father, Agrippa the first, is the one who put uh, James to death. It says, with much pomp, they entered into this place, this hearing. And by the way, you can go and Google it. This amphitheater has been uncovered and excavated there in Caesarea by the sea. When they built the Aswan Dam and they backed up the silt there, uh, there was a military helicopter, an Israeli military helicopter was flying over the area, and they looked down and they saw this horseshoe thing kind of protruding out of the sand there right on the beach. And when they excavated it, they found the docks, they found the palace, they found the amphitheater, they found the original Caesarea by the sea, the place that Paul was in prison and the place where Paul will stand and give this defense. And so they gathered not only Festus, the proconsul of the area, not only King Agrippa II, which was the governor of Jerusalem and that area with his wife Bernice, but it says the chief captains were gathered there. These are the tribunes. These were the generals of the day that were over the centurions, which were over hundreds. So the elite of the military were there. It says the principal men, all the intelligentsia and, and all of the leaders of the city were gathered there and Festus commanded that Paul would be brought forth and Paul begins to give one of the most pithy defenses of the gospel as he's standing before these people. Now this arena is very interesting because as they've excavated it they found that the acoustics of this place were so great that in the time that this place would have existed, you could have dropped a dime there where Paul was standing and you could have heard it ring in the furthest parts of this amphitheater. And of course, they're there to drop a dime on Paul as well. So, uh, so Paul is answering for that. And when we came to verse 18, he tells them how he had encountered the Lord there in the Damascus Road and what God had called him to do. Now, I want to remind you of these things because there's something as we move through the text this morning that is extremely important for us to understand. I think there's something that is lost to the church today that, that just comes to the fore at the end of this chapter in, in kind of one of those ways that if you didn't look at it carefully, you could glibly read past it and understand how profound what is being said is, how the Holy Spirit just is there writing this thing so that we can understand it. Now watch what he says in verse 18. Paul says that he was sent to open the eyes. We told you last week from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the first four verses, that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those people that are in darkness. And we have to pray that their eyes would be opened. But not only to open their eyes, but watch this, to turn them from darkness unto light. The idea is from the lies of the wicked one to the truth of God. Light is always um, used... It kind of an interchangeable way with truth. From darkness to light, from the lie of Satan, that you're your own master, that you're the captain of your own ship, um, that you're in control of your own destiny. Isn't that the lie of Satan, that he would lift his throne above the throne of the Most High and he would become even as God? That's the lie. From that lie of darkness, that you're in complete control of your life, into the light of God's truth and who really is in control. Uh, thirdly, from the power of Satan. Now, this is an important point as we walk through the rest of this chapter, and there's something I really want to bring to the fore. Because before you were saved, you were not doing your own thing, and neither was I. We were under this powerful delusion. We were under the power of the God of this world. And literally his influences upon us were so strong that we weren't doing our own thing. We thought we were doing our own thing. You know, I grew up at a time and I grew up in a culture where that was one of our sayings. Man, I'm, I'm just doing my own thing. Well, I wasn't. The drugs and the alcohol and 
and immorality, that wasn't me doing my own thing. I had a master. And the master was the prince of darkness, Grim. The master was the god of this world. The master was Satan. And I was but a puppet. But when I got saved, the Bible says God delivered me from the power of Satan, from that influence, from that control that he had over me unto the power of God. So now the Holy Spirit energizes me. The Holy Spirit is living in me. But what I want you to see is we have a different master, but we still have a master. God didn't set you free from the kingdom of darkness and from the influence of the power of the God of this air to go and do your own thing. You still have a master. We have a good master. The master we have now, if you're walking in the light, this particular master loves you with an everlasting love. He's proven his love in that he sent his son to die for your sins, to bring you back into a relationship with him, to destroy the power of the devil and the power of darkness that what held you captive, to set you free that you might walk in the light, but walk under the influence of a new master, the Lord Jesus Christ that fills you with the power of the Spirit that causes you to walk in the light of His truth. So Paul said, I was sent, first of all, to open their eyes because the God of this world had blinded their eyes. Secondly, I was called to, to translate people out of the darkness of the lies of Satan into the light of the truth of God. And then out from under the power and the influence and the bondage of Satan, that master to the new master, Jesus Christ, the master uh, of God, the power of God. And then he says that we might receive the forgiveness of sins. How many know that you're forgiven this morning? Not only the forgiveness of sins, but an inheritance. You see, we have a hope. I don't know about you, but we have a, I, I just took my grandkids up camping uh, Thursday night. We were up by Brandy City. Beautiful. The leaves are turning. Gorgeous. The pond is low. The geese are there. The ducks were there. We got to walk around the pond and just have a great time. But I will tell you this, as beautiful as, as that is, this has fallen. But we have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for us. And the Bible says, because, uh, you know, Paul could say that because he'd been there, I have not seen. And let that settle into to your heart for a moment. I have not seen. An ear has not heard. And it's not entered the heart of man. And I, I like to add, in your wildest imaginations, because sometimes I like to sit alone and think about what heaven is going to be like. The things that God has prepared for them that love Him. Man, are you homesick? Listen, I guarantee you're going to get a whole lot more homesick after November the 6th if things don't go the way they should. You're going to get real homesick. I think the Lord allows enough of this stuff to go on around us to get us homesick because this ain't our home. And He's talking about an inheritance that's incorruptible. So those five things, as we saw last week, we see again this week that Paul was sent to do, open the eyes of the blind, translate them out of darkness to light from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance with all of the saints. Paul says he wasn't disobedient to this heavenly vision. And then Paul tells us in a very masterful way in verse 20, the three things that have to be in our life to bring about these promises to us, to bring about the five things we saw in verse 18. And so in verse 20 he says uh, that they should repent, Repentance, listen, everything begins in the life of the believer in repentance. Everything begins with those in the world when they come to repentance. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because these three things are in the arrows tense in the Greek. And that means that they're in the perfect present tense. Which means not only do we repent the day we receive Christ as our Savior, but we live a life of repentance. How many know that you've got to live a life of repentance? Uh, how many kind of messed up this week? Just one or two of us, three or four of us. Uh, you know, you, you repent when you got saved. and you. Rep I heard a pastor say one time, and I agree with him because it was a thought of my heart, that, you know, I sin less and I repent more the longer you walk with the Lord. Do you know that? Because you go from the big things to the little things. 
You finally get to those little foxes, your attitudes, you know. It's not just the big stuff, the drugs, the alcohol, the immorality that kind of falls off the lying, the bitterness, the unforgiveness. That kind of, the big stuff kind of goes. But then God just kind of whittles it down and you get down to the attitude of your heart. That's stuff that you can hide, but only God can see. You, you know what I'm talking about. Where he goes right out in your heart and he says, man, what will you think of that? Why, why, why you know, I, you think you can hide that from me? I see your heart. You know, many times I'll go up and just spend a night in the woods and I'm praying and, you know, my prayers are funny because, and I've documented this, you know, I used to, I used to log it and journal it, but I don't do it anymore because it's the same. <laughs> it's just the same. It's like repeat. It's like reruns. You start praying for the church. You start praying for other people. You start praying for your enemies. And I'm not telling you, it's 15 minutes in and then you're praying for your wicked heart. And then for the next couple hours, it's about you. It's not about anybody else. It's about you because there's so much about you that needs to be brought before the Lord that just isn't right. And, and man, the Holy Spirit just starts bringing one thing after, oh, yeah, that's right, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, I need, I, I get it. I'm, my heart is desperately wicked. But Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for the work of your spirit. Repentance. And then not only repentance, you turn toward God. And that's talking about relationship. We've turned toward Him and we see Him face to face. There's a song that Keith Green sang that never made it on any of his albums. I've got all of his albums. You know, people think I'm a dinosaur and I probably am because I still listen to Keith Green. I don't know about you guys, but man, when I got saved, that guy just... Musically and lyrically, he, he just wound my clock. And he sings a song, and part of one of the lyrics go, I want to live my life. I want to live my life watching you, watching me. I don't know about you, but from the day I got saved, that's been the cry of my heart. I lived the first 20 years without you, Lord. I lived the first 20 years in darkness. I lived the first 20 years under the influence and the bondage of the God of this world. My eyes were blind. I didn't see. I had no hope. And listen, the, uh, the bondage of sin and the chains of sin had wrapped around me. And when you set me free, I, I'm telling you, I just, I want to live my life. In such relationship with you that I'm turned completely toward you. I'm not seeing you out of my peripheral vision. I'm seeing you, as it were, face to face. I want to live my life watching you, watching me. Intimacy, that's, that's what I want. And then he says, thirdly, and to do works befitting of repentance. The idea there in the Greek is works that are weighty. Spurgeon once said that, that our repentance ought to be as notorious as the crimes that we have committed. They ought to have the same weight to them. And so he's saying that these three things are necessary for the other five things to be in our life. We need to be repenting. We need to turn toward God and abide in Him because if He abides in us and we abide in Him, listen, we can ask what we will and it will be done that we need to do works that are weighty to the same weight that we have sinned, we need to show our repentance. And he says in verse 21, and this is all introduction, by the way. First 20 minutes is an introduction. Can you believe it? For this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Religious people always hate people that are walking with the Lord. Did you know that? And now we get to verse 22, and he said, having therefore obtained help of God, now, we know that the Lord has used many different means to rescue Paul over his ministry. The particular one maybe he's referring to here, this last event, he, he used a legion of Roman soldiers to deliver him from the hands of the Jews that would have literally pulled him into pieces and beat him to death. But the idea is, as Paul looks over his life, and I will tell you, I've lived long enough and walked long enough, two-thirds of my life I've walked with the Lord, that I have, I have the advantage now of hindsight. How many have the advantage of hindsight? You've walked long enough with the Lord that you can look back, and your life is not just snapshots, it's a movie. 
And you can look back, and when you play the movie of your life, you can see how many times God has delivered you, how many times God has rescued you. In fact, I was counting up the other day when I was just up in the mountains how many times God delivered me before I was even saved. And one time I remembered that we had this quarter acre garden and my dad was plowing it with a tractor and I wanted to ride on the disc that was behind the tractor and he said, yes, but you got to hang on, you got to hold on. And I was goofing off and I was probably Ian's age, I was probably eight years old and I was goofing off riding on that disc and I was looking somewhere else and I lost my balance and I fell right in front of the disc. And the very moment my feet hit the ground, the tractor stopped. My dad said, I don't even know why I look back, but I look back at the very moment you fell off before those discs ran over you, and I stopped. And the Lord reminded me, that was me saving you. I remember another time we were up at Clear Lake Fishing, and I don't know, back in the days when they had the canal that came in, you got to camp along the canal where you went out. I was goofing off again. I'm telling you, it, 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 I can get myself killed pretty easy. And if I do, man, it, I, I just moved. Because, again, goofing off at the boat, playing with the motor, fell off, got wrapped up in the weeds. And there I am looking up, and I can see the surface. And I'm drowning, and I know I'm drowning. And my dad reaches in and grabs me and pulls me out. The Lord reminded me, that was me. Your father was over there with all the people in the campground. And, you know, the Lord just... Had him look at the right time at the right place. He is an ever-present help in a time of need. And the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous continually. And his ears are attentive to their prayers. Sometimes our prayers are, help! <laughs> you know, there ain't much of a prayer, but he is attentive to those things. Paul is able to look back over his life and say, yeah, they wanted to kill me, but having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to the small and to the great, to whoever will listen, saying none other things than those things which the prophets and Moses did say should come. I like this about Paul. Paul shared his faith everywhere he went, and he never went outside of the bounds of Scripture. And you've got to understand, when he's talking about the laws of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets, he's talking about the Old Testament. That's all he had. He hadn't written the first 14 letters yet of the New Testament. He said, I stayed in bounds of Scripture, prophesying and preaching and teaching. Anybody that will listen, small or great, that was my job. And then in verse 23 he says, that Christ should suffer, this is the gospel, that he should suffer, that he should be the first to raise from the dead the first fruits of the resurrection, and that he should show the light unto the people and unto the Gentiles. Paul's message was very simple. You were born in sin, you were conceived in transgression, you came into this world messed up, you needed a Savior. God sent his only begotten Son, the second person of the Godhead, the Christ, who took on human form, who suffered and died for your sins in a propitiatory way. He, he satisfied the emotions and all paid the price for all of your sin, and then he rose again the third day, and then we are to take this gospel to the world. Paul lived very simply in that attitude. He said, that was my job. And then he says in verse 24, and as he thus spake, unto him Festus said with a loud voice. Now the idea here in the Greek is the Greek's got a voice to it. It's got seven tenses. You, you can understand when you read it in Greek what's going on. Festus is losing it. He's interrupting Paul. Paul has been talking about eyes being opened, being translated from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, the forgiveness of sins. He's, he's talking about an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that fades on away, reserved in heaven. He's talking about Jesus, the, the God-man coming and dying for your sins and raising in the third day. He's talking about a hope of eternity, a hope in eternal life. And, he's, and the Festus loses it. And with a loud voice, he interrupts Paul and he says, Paul! Paul, thou art beside thyself. You're nuts. You're much learning. I know you're a scholar. You're much learning doth make thee mad. 
You've lost your mind. How many of you ever had a relative tell you that? Or a friend? Man, you're out of your mind. No, no, no. I'm in my right mind. I had a guy tell me, and I'd heard this, so I stole the quote from Barry McGuire when I first got saved. In fact, it was one of my relatives said, you've been brainwashed. When I got saved, they told me I was brainwashed. And I said, that's a good thing. They go, what do you mean that's a good thing? I said, it's a good thing because my brains were filthy and they needed to be washed. You've been deceived. No, I haven't. I've been deceived for the first 20 years. I see clearly now. Amazing grace. It opened my eyes. I remember my dad taking me by the nap of the neck and the seat of the pants and escorting me to the front door of our home and throwing me out into the yard and said, I, I won't watch you ruin your life. Because I went home to tell him I was leaving secular college to go to Bible college. He said, I won't be a part of it. I won't watch you waste and ruin your life. Get out of here. Seventeen years later, I got to leave my father to the Lord at the kitchen table. Because I never stopped. I just kept coming back. I never saw my dad cry before that morning when he wept as he was seeking the Lord as his Savior. And the last conversation I had with my dad is he's dying of cancer, laying there in the bed. He says, son, I got to tell you something. He said, I want to tell you I'm sorry. I said, dad, we've been through this before. You're forgiven. I'm okay. We're okay. This is all good. I'm going to see you in heaven. We're going to hang out. I know that we, did, we had that time, 17 years, where we weren't hanging out, but we'll hang out in heaven. He goes, no, no, no. I want to tell you something. I need you to listen. I said, okay, what is it? He said, I want to tell you, son, I've been wrong. I've wasted my life, but you never wasted yours. I thought you were crazy. But then I realized now the last six years of serving the Lord, it's been the best six years of my life. Paul, you're mad. Your much learning has made you crazy. Watch how Paul answers this in verse 25. But he said... I'm not crazy. I'm not mad. And, and the idea in the Greek is he's very calm when he's saying this. Hey, I'm not calm, most noble Felix. Now, you're getting all flustered and you're getting all upset and, and man, you're all bit out of shape and tweaked and the Holy Spirit no doubt cooking on you and cooking in you. He, he, he's saying, it. listen, I'm not out of my mind, most noble Felix, but I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. The reason why we know that this truth was impacting Festus is because of the way that Festus responded to it. And listen, you know you're hitting your target when people are getting upset. If they don't turn to Christ and they're getting upset, you know, man, you're right on target. Just keep poking that hole because you're dead on. And then it says in verse 26, for the king knoweth. Now, <laughs> watch how Paul does this. Man, this has to be the Holy Spirit. Festus has interrupted this thing. No doubt there's hundreds of people, if not thousands of people there. They brought Paul out. He's standing there, chained, no doubt, to Roman guards. They've told him that he can speak, and he begins to lay out the gospel under the anointing of the Holy Spirit in such a profound and powerful way that, that, that this man, Festus, who is now over this providence, he's a ruler from Rome, is so convicted, he interrupts this thing. And he says, Paul, you're crazy. And Paul says, man, most notable, Festus, I'm not crazy. I speak the words of truth. I speak the words of soberness. And then he looks to King Agrippa, who's sitting there with Bernice, living in an incestuous, adulterous relationship, completely in sin, but their Jewish background, she's a Jewess, and he's trained in Judaism. They know better. And so he looks at, at King Agrippa, and he says, King, knoweth of these things before whom I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from you. For this thing was not done in a corner. Jesus didn't preach in a corner. He preached openly his own testimony at his trial there before uh, uh, that mocked up trial to, to put him to death. He said, I've, none of this is hidden. He said, none of this was hidden. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I mean, he's asking a very pointed question. Do you believe the prophets? 
He said, I know thou believest. I know you know. Whether you'll do anything about it or not, that's yet to be seen. But I know you know. And I will tell you this, every person that you share the gospel to, you can be assured they know. Because God has put into every man a measure of faith. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is in this world convicting men of sin and of righteousness and of the judgment that is to come. Every person is under that influence. And so when you come and you bring the word, when you speak the truth, when you quote the prophets and and the apostles and, and the scriptures, listen, they know it's true. And to the degree that they resist it is the degree that they don't want to believe it, but they know it. They don't want to embrace it. And then he says this, watch verse 20. I think this is one of the most tragic verses. Because we have no indication as we walk through the rest of the book of Acts, we have no indication that King Agrippa II ever came to know the Lord or Bernice. I shared with you last week that they they both fade from the scene. And we have no indication they ever come to faith. But here's what King Agrippa II says. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, listen carefully, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. That that word in the Greek, almost, is a very interesting word. It can be interpreted two ways. It can be interpreted, number one, uh, because it means in a little. It can be interpreted... In a short time, I'll become a Christian. I'm almost there, not quite, but I'm moving in that direction. Or it can mean you've shortened up the distance from me being a pagan to being a Christian, but I'm not quite there yet. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. Listen, a lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. The difference between what they know here and what they've never allowed to go in here. Almost. Almost. I love Paul's response to Agrippa. He says in verse 29, and Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but all that hear me this day, this great audience of soldiers and kings and proconsuls and princes and principal men and leaders, the intelligency of this region here of Caesarea, Not only you, Agrippa, but everyone that's listening to me this day were both almost and all together such as I am, except without these bonds. I want you all in. This is amazing to me. Paul is in chains. Paul is in bondage. And he's speaking before the people that are going to sentence him, that are going to write those charges against him. As it were, they were at that moment in the physical realm his enemies. And notice his response to his enemies, similar to what Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what to do. He is saying to his enemies, he's saying to the whole Roman Empire, he's saying, you know, to to Festus and to King Agrippa, to Bernice, to everybody that's listening, I wish that you weren't almost but all together, even as I am, that you were a follower of Christ. Only without these chains. Verse 30 says, and when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, that's Festus, and Bernice, and they that sat with them, all of the leaders, and when they had gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, this man doth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Now listen to verse 32, because I think there's an important thing I want to bring to the fore here. You could read past it glibly and understand how profound this one little verse is. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, this man might have been set at liberty. He might have been set free. He may have had his liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Here's what I want you to see, and I think this is the concept as the Lord was just as I was looking at this again this week, and I think there's a concept lost to the church today. Bud and I were talking about it up in the prayer room, this thing of ownership, this thing of who you are in Christ Jesus. Let me say this this morning before we move on any further. 
Romans chapter 1, the very next book we're going to study, it is the gospel according to Paul. Paul will lay out in a very powerful way the gospel message to the Romans in this pithy. He's already penned it at this point. He's already sent it by Phoebe when he left Centuria to go to Jerusalem where he was arrested before he was sent to Caesarea. This book has already been two years in circulation. Paul, when he opens the letter of Romans in chapter 1, verse 1, he says this, Paul. You know, Saul means great one. Paul means little. Like, like a little rock. Like little. Like nothing. Paul, the slave. That word for servant is doulos. Paul was calling himself a douloi, which means you're an abject slave. That means you have no rights. You have no privileges. You have no aspirations. Your life is owned by somebody else. And to the degree and to the extent that you lose your identity, you lose your name, and your master gives you a new name. That's why the Bible says we have a new name written down in glory for you and I waiting on the other side of this thing. To the extent that you don't get to decide where you go, where you live, what you do. The master is in control of that as a slave. Uh, you don't get to determine how you work, how long you work, or what you do. The master is in control of that. Every aspect of your life, your future, your past, your present, is owned by the master when you're a slave. And the word here he uses is abject slavery, which means you've lost everything, and now you've become the property of the master. Listen carefully. Paul said, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. The question today is, do we view ourselves in that light and in that regard? Or do we view ourselves today, because I think a lot of Christianity today is, I'm saved and I'm saved by grace. I, I've got my ticket stamped. I've got my fire insurance. So now I get to go live my life however I want. The Bible knows nothing of that about us as believers. Paul would say things like, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But it's not me any longer that's in control. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Then he says, he goes on to say in Romans, called to be an apostle. So not only am I God's slave, I'm God's servant, I'm the slave of Jesus Christ, but he called me away from my old lifestyle to something he wanted me to do. So I'm doing the master's bidding. I'm now an apostle of Jesus Christ, separated. That means everything in this life has been separated from me. I'm separated unto the gospel of God. And listen, those three aspects are in you and me. You know, my son was saying when he moved out to Wyoming, Dad, when are you going to retire? I said, I don't know. He said, when you retire, move out here with us. I said, I don't know. Why don't you don't know? Why don't you know? It's because my life's not my own. I don't own this life. He said, what do you mean? I said, 43 years ago, I became a dead man. Jesus owns me. I do the master's bidding. Well, California and this, and I said, it doesn't matter. He said, if you told me to move to San Francisco, I would. Really? Yeah. I'd hate it, but I'd do it. You don't have to like it. You Like you tell your kids, you don't have to like it, but you better do it. I may not like it. I would have to have God to change my heart, but I would do it. I lived in Bakersfield as a kid. I tell you what, when I lived in Bakersfield, all I can remember is the smell of onions, hot and dusty. I would even go to Bakersfield if God told me to go to Bakersfield. I'm so glad he told me to go to Grass Valley. I am so glad. But I'm not my own. No man can set me at liberty because the master owns me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, Paul records these words as well. And by the way, he's already penned this letter. He penned it up in Philippi before he left to go to Centuria, before he left to go to Jerusalem. He writes these words. What? 
Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? Which you have of God, that's how you were born again, and you are not your own. Those three words, I'll tell you, most Christians tremble at and shudder against and resist. But you're not your own. Did you know that? You are not your own. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 20, for you are bought with a price. You belong to the master. The master purchased you. He rescued you. He redeemed you. Listen, you belong to the master. And I belong to the master. And our master's a good master. He took us out of darkness away from that wicked master and he made us his master, the master of light. He opened our eyes. He took us out from under the influences of the power of Satan and he, he gave us the power of God. He put it in us. He forgave us of our sins and he gives us an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, and fades not away. But we belong to the master. And listen, Christian, you are not your own. We need to get rid of this concept that I'm the master of my own destiny. I'm the captain of my own ship because you are not and neither am I. Oh, we don't have the old master anymore. The Lord delivered us from the power of Satan and from uh, the destruction of the devil. And brought us into this marvelous kingdom of light and hope and peace and forgiveness that has an inheritance but we are not our own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, therefore, in light of, you're not your own and you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That means know how to possess this vessel as a vessel of honor. You don't give in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, or the pride of life. It's not about you. You control this body, you, you discipline this body, you beat this body, as Paul would say, in this objection. It's called sanctification. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit works on. That's the deepest recesses. That's our attitude. That's our thought life in our spirit, which, by the way, belong to who? Who are they? Who do they belong to? Who does your body and spirit belong to? Yeah. You know, Pastor, you're freaking me out. No, I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth this morning. That's why Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Now, Jesus didn't say there was a third one, did he? Or a fourth. There's no other options. There are only two masters. And if you become your own master, you really aren't. You ain't. You have a cruel master. But if you give your life to the Lord. I was talking to somebody the other day and I, I had to remind them because the conversation was going in this direction that they were free. They had liberties. They could do what they wanted to do because Christ has set them free. And I said, you know what? You're one of those kind of Christians that think that the Lord Jesus Christ is his name. Lord is his first name. Jesus is his second name. And Christ is his last name. Lord is the position that he holds in your life. Christ is his ministry. He's the anointed one. Jesus is his name. Jesus is the Lord of my life. Paul would say, I serve. I'm the servant. I'm the slave of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, as we move on into chapter 27, I won't hammer this much too much longer, but does that make you uncomfortable? Or does that make you feel very protected and very blessed? Because the master was also required to protect his slaves. He was required to treat them with honor and respect. He was required to minister to all of their needs, financial, physical, spiritual, emotional, every need that the servant had. The master was required to take care of that need because that person belonged to the master and the master was obligated to take care of them. I don't know about you, but I like belonging to the master. I like it. Because the Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for me, so when I'm stupid as a slave and I do stupid things, my master stands up and said, okay, that's right, he did something stupid, but he belongs to me. 
and you don't get to accuse him. You know, another master couldn't accuse another master's servant. Did you know that? That's why the Bible says, who are you, O man, who accuses another man's servant? Before his master, he stands and falls. And yea, the master is even able to make him to stand. I pray this concept in the 21st century would seek in the Christians and understand that you have a master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've surrendered all of your rights. I had a lady tell me one time she was a king's daughter and she had a right to be happy so she was divorcing her husband. And I said, I don't know what master you're listening to, but it's not the true master. We have a master. And so when Agrippa says to Festus, this man might have been set free. No, no, no. He could never be set free. He wasn't free to do his own bidding because he still had a master. Now let's get him on a ship. We'll get him a little ways down the road before we quit this morning. Chapter 27 begins his journey to Rome where he will stand before Caesar. And it will be an interesting journey. And there's one other point I want to make before we quit. I want to get at least to verse 11. Watch what he says here. Some of his narrative will read quite quickly through it. He said, And when it was determined that he should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul to a certain other and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius. This is the centurion. He's the captain of a hundred, but he's the centurion of Augustus. So he's of the elite there because he was of the Augustus band, Caesar's band. And entering to a ship that was sailing from Adramidium, we launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, and one Aristarchus of Macedonia, a Thessalonican, being with us. This is interesting, because you remember, as we were studying, when Paul came to Jerusalem, he brought Aristarchus and Secundus with him. They were both from Thessalonica. Aristarchus' very name means of an aristocratic sort. So his family probably was a very prestigious family in Thessalonica. Secundus means second. When you would name your servants, the first servant was Primus, kind of like the, one of those transformers, the prime. Primus was your first servant. Secundus was your second servant. And these guys coming to faith were equal and traveled with Paul. Now, because of probably some of the political influence, Aristarchus is now traveling with Paul to Rome because what he has to say as an aristocrat would have weight in defending Paul. And so they leave together, and on the next day, they touched at Sidon. So if you look on a map, Caesarea is on the sea. You go straight north from Caesarea, you'll come to Sidon. And as they stopped in Sidon, the Roman centurion there gave Paul permission to entertain, which means he was able to speak to the Christians that were there. And verse 4 says, And when they had launched from there, they sailed under the cover of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. That means when they left Sidon, they sailed along the coastline so that the mainland and the island of Cyprus would protect them from the winds. We're going to see why in a few moments. And when they had sailed, verse 5 says, over the sea unto Cilicia, Pamphylia. That's the regions that Paul came to originally. You remember when he sailed into Pamphylia and he went up to the Antioch Presidia on his first missionary journey? So they're following the coastline. They're not far from Ephesus here. They came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there they found, and note this, there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria. I like that the Holy Spirit says this. Because the ships of Alexandria were, were, were weak freighters. And we know how big a wheat freighter was. This boat was 140 feet long and 36 feet wide. It would have had a crew of about 250 men. We're going to see in a, in, in next week there was 260 souls on board. 266 souls on board. This sanctuary is 80 feet across. So you can add another two-thirds on and that's how long this ship would have been. This is not a small boat. This is a wheat freighter that sailed from Egypt, from the regions of Alexandria, and that would deposit grain through the Roman Empire. So this centurion finds this wheat freighter, 140 feet long, 36 feet wide, a crew of 250. They book passage onto this ship, and it says, and, and, and then it says this in verse 7, And when they had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were even come to Sidus, 
the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salamone. Now, they're sailing under Crete, and they'll come about to the middle of the island, the south part of the island. Now, I know you want to know all these things, but this is important for, for, for a reason in a moment. So they're in the middle of the south part of the island of Crete, and, and they come to this place that's called Fair Haven, but it was everything but Fair Haven. Ha, have you ever rented a motel room that the name never lined up with what you experienced? <laughs> this is that Fair Haven. I mean, you know, you, you, you think that, you know, you, you, you found a really nice place. Not so nice. And in fact, they're going to use language like not commodious to weather there. Uh, it was exposed. The, 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 the south winds could blow. And we're going to see in a few moments this thing called a Eurocliden. I've had people ask me what a Eurocliden is. It's very simple. Euro means Europe. That's where we get the word Europe from. But it means northeast. And there was a wind that would come down from the Arctic, cross the north through the mainland, blowing northeast, and would come down and it would circle around the Medi Mediterranean, and then it would go back up across the continent, back towards Syria, that way Lebanon, and up north that way. And between September and November, you would get these Euroclidons. Now the Euro means the direction the wind came. The Clyde meant that it rocked the seas and the waves became you know, huge, like sometimes 15-foot waves because of these Euroclidons. And so it says here, we hardly passed by the place that was called Fair Haven, nigh whereunto uh, was the city of Lycia. Now when much time had been spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, this is in that season between September the 14th and November the 11th, they just did not sail in the open seas at that time in the Mediterranean because it was dangerous at this time to sail. And they said, because the fast was now already past, we're already into that season, Paul admonished them. Now watch what he says here. Paul admonished them. This is the next point I want to make. Because I think sometimes the Lord admonishes us to do something. Even sometimes it's that still small voice. It's that work of the Spirit in our hearts. Or there's something as we're reading the Word uh, and, and God's Holy Spirit just causes that to jump out at us, and it's an admonition. God is speaking something into our hearts and into our lives. Paul said in him, Sirs, I perceive. Circle that word. We're going to get to that in a moment. Very interesting word. I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading, not only to the cargo, not only to the wheat, but the ship also, and also even our lives. If you sail from this harbor now, we could lose the cargo, we could lose the ship, and we could lose our lives. I perceive, I'm admonishing you that I perceive that danger is ahead. Now, I grew up in the time where danger, danger, Will Robinson. You know, that, that, that robot was kind of like the Holy Spirit. When, when danger would come, he would sound off. And then you, you, you had... Uh, Dr. Smith that would never listen and always get into trouble. Watch what happens here. Now we know at this point from 2 Corinthians 11.25 that Paul has already been shipwrecked three times. Paul has traveled over 6,000 miles in the ocean. So he has some experience with sailing. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about something deeper than just experience. The word for experience in the Greek is gnosko. That means knowledge that is a, that's gained by experience. And sometimes God uses the knowledge that we gain by experience, but other times He uses a different kind of knowledge. And this is what's being said here. The, the word is oetis. It means a knowledge that is arrived are derived by a work of the Spirit and the heart and the mind of the believer. Have you ever been doing something and you just sense that warning or feel that understanding? Don't go here, don't do that. And how many have listened to it? How many haven't listened to it? We're going to see what happens when you don't listen to it next week. But nevertheless, listen carefully, the centurion believed the master of and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. 
So listening rather to man's wisdom instead of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, that's number one. Number two, and because the haven was not commodious, not comfortable to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain unto Phoenice and to winter there. So two reasons. They wanted their comfort and they listened to man's wisdom more than even God's wisdom. And we're going to see next week they get into trouble. I want to leave you with one verse I think is very important. I've learned to live my life by it. I think it's extremely important. It comes from the Proverbs. You'll know it when I have them put it on the screen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. How many know that verse? You bet you do. Trust in the Lord. How is God leading you today? How is God directing you today? What is God saying to you today? When you sit alone with Him and you're in a time of devotions or prayer and you're reading His Word, what is He saying? What is He telling you to do and what is He telling you not to do? Because He speaks. Trust in the Lord with part of your heart. Trust in, excuse me, I read that wrong. Trust in the Lord with most of your heart. What does this say? Because I'll tell you, many of you have shipwrecked and lost a lot of stuff because you didn't listen. Now, we're going to see that Paul warned them that we're going to lose the cargo, we're going to lose the ship, we're going to lose lives. The Lord will speak to Paul and say, no, no, nobody's going to die, but you're going to lose the ship and you're going to lose the cargo because you didn't listen. Paul will actually say, we'll see it next week, you should have listened. Neener, neener, neener kind of a thing. And I tell you, so many times the Lord has told me the same thing. You should have listened. What's wrong with you? I'm telling you what you need to be doing and you're not listening. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to thy own understanding. Oh man, we, want to, we don't want to winter here. We want to winter there. It's nicer there in Phoenicia than it is here in Fairhaven. Fairhaven, man, that's not even a good name for this place. And besides the uh, the commander, the centurion, believed the owner of the ship more than he did Paul. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Man, I'm going to tell you, the steps of a righteous man are order of the Lord. You need to listen. You need to listen. Any decision made in haste is never a good one. Bathe it in prayer. Listen. Don't try to justify your position. When people come in and start to justify, I know that you're trying to talk yourself out of what the Holy Spirit is saying into what you think. Stop it. Listen. Two great points that are brought to the fore just as they come out kind of glibly as we're walking through the narrative. Number one, you belong to a master. You're not free. I'm not free. We're not free. We belong to the Lord. And secondly, because we belong to him, we need to listen. When he admonishes, we need to listen, not just with our experience, but with the inner ear of the Holy Spirit that's in us. We need to listen and be obedient because when we don't, it can cost us. God is always gracious, but it can still cost you. Amen? Amen. Well, read ahead. We'll finish it up next week. Let's stand. Worship team, will you come? We'll close on the last song. Let me ask you, how, how many got convicted this morning? Raise your hand, be honest. How many got convicted? Just one, two, three, four, five, six. Listen, I'm, I got both my hands up. You guys have to listen for an hour. I have to study for like for 15 hours and get hammered. And then I got to go pray about it and get hammered some more. Listen, man, this thought, and I was talking with Bud about this up in the prayer room before the service this morning. This concept is lost to the church today, I think. How many would agree this thing of the Lord being your master? And how many Christians make stupid decisions and foolish decisions because they don't listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit? But we walk in our own wisdom and we choose things that are comfortable. Might not be the wisest choice. I want, when I get on the other side of this thing, for my master to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want my master to say to me, 
well done. You weren't perfect, but you were a good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. I don't want him to say to me, you were saved because you received the forgiveness that my son offers, but you were just uncontrollable. You did things after your own thinking, your own will. You were self-willed and self-seeking. You were selfish. I don't want him to say that to me. I want him to say that, Mike, you did your best. And you always lived with that attitude that I was your master. Not just your Savior, but your Lord. Amen. It'll change the way you think. It'll give you a different worldview. It'll give you a peace that passes all understanding because if he truly is your master, then he has to take care of you. And you won't worry about your future. You won't worry about your past. Nobody can bring an accusation against another man's master because the master defends his servants. I'm glad I have a master. And I'm glad my master is Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, may that be true of all of us, those listening by live stream, those listening later by the internet, the website, those listening here today. May it be true in us, Lord, that you are our master. And because you are, when you speak to us, when you admonish us, and we perceive it, we listen to it. We don't listen to the world's wisdom. We listen to you and your voice. And I pray that for all of us, for me included this morning, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus, lover of my soul, I will never let you go You've taken me from the miry clay You've set my feet upon the rock And now I know I love you I need you Though my world may fall Lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I. Let me just say this. You know, I was thinking as we were singing, 
thinking about God being my master, that a number of years ago, when before Ben's voice got bad and he was our worship leader here, he got his ear pierced, and I, I had somebody come and complain to me. And I said, why would you complain about something that's extremely scriptural? What? I said, yeah, it's extremely scriptural. If I wasn't so fearful, I'd do it. What? I said, yeah, there's a certain point when you become a servant of the master that you love the master so much that the master takes you to the doorpost of his home and he puts your ear to the doorpost and he pokes it with an awl. Then he puts a ring in it. And you become a love slave to the master. I don't like needles and I certainly don't like awls. So I just pretend one's there because that's what I am. I'm a love slave to the master. That's the best place on the planet to be. Amen. Father, may we all be that. You know, if we don't have pierced ears, maybe in our heart of hearts, it would be as we did in the ring of the master that shows our devotion, our dedication, our loyalty, our commitment, our consecration. Not because we have to, but because we choose to serve the master. His ring is in our ear. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, may it not be something outward, may it be something inward. Bless these dear people, Father. Lord, as we're seeing the time coming close to you returning for us, Lord, help us, keep us, guard us, fill us with your spirit, Lord. In fact, this Wednesday night, Lord, we just want to gather on that wicked holiday called Halloween. We want to gather here this Wednesday night and just worship you, and we want to pray. We want to pray for this nation. We want to pray for the godly leaders of this nation. We want to pray for the pastors. We want to pray for the election that's coming up just next week. So, Lord, as we gather here this Wednesday night and we lift our voices in praise and worship and we lift our voices in prayer, Father, hear us, Lord. And if it's not in your keeping to heal this nation, give us a reprieve, then just take us home. We're okay with either one. The latter is better to me than the first, but whatever you want to do, Father. But bless these people. May we walk in light of eternity, Father. May we walk as those who have been bought that are owned by the Master and we're not our own. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus we ask. And all God's sons and daughters would say, amen, amen. Amen. Hey, if you need special prayer, we'll be up here to pray with you and for you. Other than that, you are dismissed the fellowship.